my lovely imps, Dragon's Dogma 2! Or as some are calling it, Dragon's Dog Poop! <laughs> Just kidding! I actually really, 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 really like Dragon's Dogma 2. Like, a lot. Like, I'm... I want to go play it right now. But I am currently six and a half hours into a live stream, and I promised you all that I would talk about it, and I want to talk about it, but I also really want to go play it right now. Okay? Um... Dragon's Dogma 2 is the sequel to Dragon's Dogma 1. And... It sure is Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, I, so I, I want to tell you about my history with Dragon's Dogma, okay? My history with Dragon's Dogma is that I only played the first game last week. And I had a really good time with the first game. And you might be going, well, what the hell? It's been out for like a million years and you didn't even play it until last week. Why? And um, the answer is because of something really funny. When Dragon's Dogma came out originally, three of my roommates were all playing it at the same time, okay? And Dragon's Dogma has a very unique quirk about it, which is that all of the characters talk in fake Old English. So they say things like, there is aught here! If you go into town, you will find aught things to do! Um, they say things like, um, we ought to search for aught that is here! They say things like, uh, arisen, my lord! Wolves hunt in packs! Be cautious that you don't get overwhelmed! Try dousing it with oil! Oil always catches flame quickly! Um, that's basically how all of the characters in the game talk at all times. Um, and they love, they, they really love the word ought. And they use ought all the time. It's actually wild how frequently they use the word ought. It's shocking. But anyway, um, I was, I, three of my roommates at the time were playing Dragon's Dogma. And I heard the game so much that I... Uh, developed a a version to it because I just heard the sound effects, the music, the there is aught here, um, over and over and over again. And there's another line which is going to activate the dragon's dogma heads in the audience. Ready? Which is masterworks all can't go wrong. Masterworks all you can't go wrong. That line, I heard. So many times, not just from the actual games being played around me in my the house that I lived in many years ago, but also because my roommates started ironically repeating that line to each other all the time. Uh, they would open the fridge and say, would you like a soda? You say, yeah, sure. And they'd be like, masterworks all, you can't go wrong. Which one would you like? The masterworks all, you can't go wrong. It was a lot, okay? It was a lot. And so I just never played the game because I was just like, oh, I've heard so much Dragon's Dogma that, uh... and it's actually really funny. When I went to play Dragon's Dogma, I got to the guy, the Masterworks All You Can't Go Wrong guy, and I had forgotten that it was from Dragon's Dogma, that I had heard that line so many times that I didn't even remember it being from Dragon's Dogma. And the moment that character went, Masterworks all, you can't go wrong. It was like getting hit by a bus, okay? I, I was just like, every time my friends had said that over the course of years, hit me all at once. <sighs> anyway, uh, I did have a lot of fun going and playing Dragon's Dogma 1. And I'm, I'm... I know why everybody likes it. And then Dragon's Dogma 2 came out. Now I was excited for Dragon's Dogma 2, which might seem might seem odd, given that I didn't play Dragon's Dogma 1 until last week, but I've been watching the approach of Dragon's Dogma 2 from afar. And I was going, hmm, hmm. 
And I like a lot of Capcom games, specifically the Monster Hunter series. This game had a lot of Monster Hunter-y elements, and I was like, ooh. And then it came out. It came out two days ago, and I have played it an unhealthy amount. Now, to be fair, I'm a gamer. First, first, excuse me, um, excuse me, I'm a gamer. And secondly, I had a really bad cold, so how dare you? I was sick, and I was sipping my, my fluids and staying warm, and I needed something to keep me going. So I just played Dragon's Dogma for like 16 hours over the course of two days. How dare you? I was sick. But I had a really goddamn good time, okay? Um... And in fact, I'm going to tell you a little anecdote about my experience of booting up Dragon's Dogma 1, okay? Or Dragon's Dogma 2, sorry. I booted up Dragon's Dogma 2 after installing it. Actually, I installed the game, and then I shouted down to the rest of my house, Dragon's Dogma 2 is unlocked! You guys can start installing now! And everybody in the house started installing it, because everybody, with the exception of my partner Doe, are currently playing Dragon's Dogma 2. So we all downloaded it. And then we started the game, and we were all making our characters. And two hours passed, you know, past the refund period. And I was still in the character creator. My partners were already playing the game, and I could hear their pawns going, There is aught here! There is aught here! There is, there is aught manner of, of, of high-quality ingredients over here, my lord! Um, I could hear that from their games. And I was still in the character creator because the character creator is really intense and there's quite a lot. And I was trying to create a specific character. I was trying to create my beautiful character from Dark Souls 2. And that was, that proved to be impossible. I could not recreate my Dark Souls 2 character correctly in the Dr Dragon's Dogma 2. But I made another character that I was quite happy with. And finally, I started the game. And within seconds of starting the game, I realized that I'd made a foul mistake. Uh, which is that, be very careful, okay? Just, this is my word of caution so you don't make the mistake. Be very careful with the mouth protrusion because it might look okay in the character creator and you might think, well, the mouth protrusion value is still very low, so I'm probably going to be fine. But when that motherfucking character hits the first cutscenes, in-game cutscenes, my character straight up looked like the dude from uh, Italian Spider-Man. You guys ever seen Italian Spider-Man? Oh my god. Uh, there's this... Oh my god, I gotta, I gotta bring this up. The guy, the, there's this, there's this part in Italian Spider-Man, okay, where, um, hold on, let me just, let me just show you this guy right here. I, I got to the first cutscene, and my character straight up looked like this guy right here. I, I was laughing, and I was so mad, and it made my partners were laughing because I was like, why is my character all of a sudden the guy from Italian Spider-Man? And and it was so annoying. It was driving me absolutely bananas, okay? Every cutscene, my character was going... And I was like, no! Stop! Why? So be careful. And my character's mouth protrusion was not high, okay? It was... It was... So... The long, uh, this, this will make sense why I'm talking about this. You might be going, this is the worst review of a video game I've ever heard. Why the fuck are we talking about Italian Spider-Man in the review of Dragon's Dogma 2? But it'll make sense in a minute. I promise. It'll all make sense. It's all gonna come together. Like poetry, it's gonna rhyme. Okay? I promise. My character. Arisen! There are aught monsters here! Okay, so I, I, I swallowed my pride and continued playing the game, all right? 
and I, I was running around and I was shooting magic and climbing up weird walls and, and picking up items and learning all kinds of stuff and listening to the funny accents. And I got to make my first pawn, which my pawn is uh, named after my dog Yoda. And she's amazing and I love her and I will protect her to the ends of the earth. My pawn is a little hunched over Beastrin that looks like a dog and has a little tan mohawk. Looks just like my dog Yoda. Everybody, this is the moment in chat where you spam the Yoda emoji. Uh, go ahead, hit up hit up the Yoda emojis. This is a perfect time, you know? We want to see the Yodas. Let's see some Yodas in chat, everybody. Look at those Yodas. Beautiful. My pawn looks just like my dog. <sighs> Amazing. Beautiful. Uh, and so, there we go. There we have it. Look at all those Yodas. So adorable. There's the Yoda barking. Now, in Dragon's Dogma 1, my Yoda pawn had a very high-pitched voice and it was extremely funny because in Dragon's Dogma 1 you could have comically high-pitched and comically low-pitched voices. Unfortunately, you can't do that in Dragon's Dogma 2. The voice acting is really good though. Uh, the accents are still very funny. They still say ought all the time but the voice acting is, a, is really nice in Dragon's Dogma 2. But I was playing fighting monsters, loving the world. The music is great. The, the world looks beautiful. I was having some performance issues and I'm gonna talk about those a little bit more in a minute. We'll get there. But I, I started to get a little tired in my first day of playthroughs. And so I took a break. And it was then that I realized that Capcom had seriously fucked up. Because I went on to Twitter to see what people were saying about Dragon's Dogma 2, and I was like, boy, I had a great time. People must be loving this game. Oh no. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh no, 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 they were not. They were not tweeting about how they were having a good time with the game at all. They were in fact very angry. And that was when I realized that there were microtransactions in the game that I never noticed. And, and I went to Steam and I saw, sure enough, on the store page, there were microtransactions there that I did not see because I had just clicked download the game, which I had bought. I pre-ordered it like a day before. I don't generally do pre-orders, but I had decided I wanted to play this one. So I, I, I bought the pre-order like a day before. You know, shame on me, I guess. Um, and then there were there were now microtransactions, and people were very mad about that. So let's talk about the microtransactions, because I noticed at that point that one of the microtransactions was a character recreation item. Now, I happen to know already that you could recreate your character in game with a item that costs rift crystals. Rift crystals are not premium or they weren't premium currency. They're still not really premium currency. They're kind of premium currency. In the first game, rift crystals are just a special item that you pick up from killing certain types of monsters and doing certain quests that allow you to recruit pawns to your team. They're a, they're an, they, they are just stuff that you spend on pawns, okay? And in this game, that's also true. You can spend your Rift Crystals to uh, recreate your character. And obviously, I needed to do that because of the aforementioned Italian Spider-Man face, you know? Where my character would go every five seconds in the cutscenes. I couldn't handle it. So I knew I needed to do that. And it was at this point that I discovered that you could actually just buy with real money from Steam, you could just go and buy uh, uh, an item that lets you change your character. And I said, well, that seems weird. Is it gonna be like a million dollars in game? 
And of course, uh, the next day I went back and played again and I discovered, well, no, actually it's not a million dollars. In fact, it's, it's, pul it's paltry. It costs like 500 Rift Crystals, which is basically nothing. It's really easy to get 500 Rift Crystals if just playing the game. And that's all that you need in order to remake your character's appearance. So I didn't get it. And I looked at the other, uh, uh, the other items that were being sold. And let me tell you, these are some of the most pathetic and sad DLCs I've ever seen in my entire life, okay? Um, they are selling, so the items that they're selling as DLCs are an item that lets you ma do a makeover on your character. You could purchase Rift Crystals outright, which is, again, Rift Crystals are plentiful in the world. And the amount of Rift Crystals that they sell you with the, with the DLC microtransaction is not enough to be impactful in any way. Like, you would have to pay real money to get an embarrassingly low amount of Rift, Rift Crystals. I don't even know why they would bother. So then you can buy Extra Lives, which... Extra lives in Dragon's Dogma are fairly rare items. But when I say fairly rare, I mean like you're going to get one every couple hours of play. More frequently, if you're playing, uh, you know, very effectively, you're going to find these items from exploring the world, from doing quests, from looking around. So they're not, they're, they're rare, but they're not that rare. They're not rare that you, so rare that you want to pay money for them. And then fast travel items. Now, this game, Dragon's Dogma 2, before launch, was very big about boasting about how they were clamping down on fast travel. And I don't think that's true at all. Um, in fact, um, in my experience, the fast traveling is more, there is more fast travel in Dragon's Dogma 2 than there was in Dragon's Dogma 1 unless you're playing Dark Arisen or whatever the, the expansion is called where they give you a free fast travel that let you can use infinite number of times. There are ox carts you can ride on. There are port crystals you can use. Um, it isn't, it's, it's less fast travel than a game like Oblivion or uh, Morrowind, or not Morrowind, um, uh, Skyrim, for sure. Uh, way less fast travel than that. But there's still quite a lot of fast travel, and for some reason, and you can find fast travel items in the game all the fuck over the place. You can buy them from a merchant for a little bit of gold. I mean, okay, in, it's actually a, a fairly large amount of gold, but not an unreasonable amount of gold. I'm talking like, you can get a couple of fast travel items in game in like an hour of play, you could get one or two fast travel items in an hour of play, and they're selling it for like three bucks, two or three dollars on the microtransactions. So let's just get all the facts laid out straight here now that I've given you the narrative version. The microtransactions for this game are commonly available item Commonly available item, commonly available item in an incredibly embarrassingly small amount, a commonly available item, and then an uncommon item that you can trade for with extremely common items in the game. Why? Just, just why? First of all, the, they pissed everyone off really bad by sneaking in microtransactions after the launch. They never said anything about microtransactions before the launch. They also pissed everyone off by having two of the microtransaction items being counters to the stated design philosophy of the game. Right? So the game, before launch, they were boasting about how, um, in fact, no, I'll even go far, one step further. The director of the game explicitly stated that the reason he doesn't like fast travel is because he thinks that if your game is well made, 
traveling from place to place should be fun and you shouldn't want to fast travel. That was a statement made by the director of the game. And then they put in fast travel tokens that you can buy with money. And then the other thing, of course, is that this game is... Dragon's Dogma is sort of infamously hard. Um, not like... Not like... You know... Incredibly hard. But fairly punishing. Dragon's Dogma is a game... Both the first and the second one are games... They kill you. A lot. In very funny and weird ways. And, and it's very Dungeons and Dragons, like classic Dungeons and Dragons in that way. Sometimes you'll be in an unfamiliar area and if you move too quickly, a bunch of slimes will drop on your head. And if you don't have the healing items and whatever, you're going to get toasted. And it's funny and it's great. But then they put lives that you can buy with money. But at the same time lives aren't even that rare in the first place. So the microtransactions quite literally make no sense. I don't know what the hell they were thinking. They pissed everyone off because it's a $70 game that now has stupid microtransactions in it. I didn't even know the microtransactions were there because I played the game the moment it launched and didn't notice that they were there and I'm not the only player who was like that. So it's a really, really weird decision that piss a lot of people off for basically no reason. In my opinion, these microtransactions are basically there to mislead players and to prey on spending slash optimization addicts. It really doesn't make any sense to me other than that. These items are not hard to attain. Um, the only people I can really feel uh, being tempted to buy them are people who are um, who who just compulsively spend on video games in order in the name of optimization, and even then it's still not that much. Especially the rift crystals, they give you like a paltry amount of rift crystals. You not even enough to really make sense. It's it's very silly. Okay, really really silly. Uh. And then there's another issue, okay? Which is what a lot of people are getting mad about, which was the performance. The game has some performance issues. It does. It struggles, okay? Um, specifically, it struggles with frame rate. Um, the game, and, and crashing. Uh, a lot of people have had issues with crashing in the character creator, which is very annoying. And the frame rate issues are, I have experienced them on my fairly high-end system. Now, I don't have like a cutting-edge gaming computer, but I have a pretty good one. I do streaming and I game on my stream, so it's a pretty decent computer. Uh, and it has, I've been, I've struggled to keep the frame rate up. Even with reduced settings, the frame rate still struggles. It has optimization problems. It has, uh, it is not just a raw performance um, you know, it's not a matter of your system stats. Uh, even on a killer system, uh, people are having the frame rate issues. So, it, and now Capcom already released a statement saying they're going to try and patch that in. But it is really disappointing that basically every major studio release these days is not functional, like is not functioning to its advertised statistics on launch. Now, I'm not saying that every game needs to have flawless 4K, 120 FPS, perfect optimization on the day that it launches. But if you're advertising the game and you're showing off the game in those statistics, there's not a single goddamn game recently from major publishers that has launched and actually worked. It has just become completely standard for them to launch the game and then spend weeks afterwards doing patches to fix up shit that probably should have been done before they launched the game. Because it creates a frustrating and annoying launch, sometimes a debilitating launch where you can't even play the game because the performance is so bad. Um, it's unfortunate, okay?
Nerodia says, uh, they sneaked in de novo. Both de novo and micro microtransactions weren't there in the review copies. Unfortunately, that is not true. Um, and this one uh, kind of has to stand on reviewers. Uh, I, I watched the uh, a video of a reviewer that I very much, uh, very much overall trust, and they admitted that they missed the microtransactions. Um, they, that the microtransactions were present in the press materials that they were given and that they neglected to mention them because they forgot about them, which is, that's a little, you know, gamers, okay? Gamers. They're really sub, they're, gamers are weak to hype, okay? They're really weak to hype. Um, yeah. It sucks, but yes, um, unfortunately, uh, as I have seen confirmation that yes, the microtransactions were talked about in the review copies and you know, wouldn't you know it, just none of those reviewers managed to mention the microtransactions. You know, this is a problem that games reviewing has always had, um, that people don't ever they very rarely ever talk about this but the real problem that that uh review based games journalism actually has is the fact that um those who are given review copies are um heavily incentivized to give more positive reviews because if they don't they just won't be given a review copy in the future and you know gaming uh content creation on the internet is very much you got to hit that shit while it's trendy you got to hit that shit while it's hot you know you got to get it out there bam 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 you got to get that review out you got to get that commentary out so there's an incentive for uh gaming creators to court getting review copies they know it's not just anecdotal. It, we know that gaming companies won't give review copies to people that they think are going to give negative reviews. There are, uh, uh, you know, critical game reviewers don't tend to get sent review copies for many games for, for obvious reasons. Those companies have a financial interest in their game getting as positive reviews as possible. So there is a, a pressure even on good game reviewers being put at all times to just err on the side of positivity, to err on the side of making sure that they can get their review copies in the future. Exactly. Danny says, you got to release the review on embargo. Make the content before we push the thing that upsets people. Exactly. Exactly, precisely. And um, it's, it is unfortunate, but it also, it, it's one of those things where you have to, gamers, the intelligent gamer will learn to uh, make themselves more immune to hype. No one is completely immune to hype. I admit this myself in getting hyped up for things like Death Stranding. Um, but I am very resistant to hype. That much I know. And we should be more resistant. I should be more resistant. And in fact, I've gotten better and better over the years, but hype will lead you very far astray. It very much will. Now, now that I've talked about the controversy around uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, which just real quick, just so that I can confirm to you guys the state of affairs, okay? Um, real quick, take a look at this. Dragon's Dogma 2, a fan, a, a cult classic game launched with mixed reviews. Now, this is actually an improvement since the last time I checked. The last time I checked, it was at uh, negative. 49% of the reviews are positive. So there is a majority of negative reviews for this game at this particular moment, okay? Very, 
very strong negative reviews. So that's the controversy, just so you guys get a picture of how mad people are about this game. Now I want to talk to you um, about some other things about the game, about the actual game itself. Well, okay, all of that was about the game itself. But uh, people have a right to be mad, okay? However, there's a lot to enjoy in this game. And I've been having a lot of fun with the game. Now, a game cannot be separated from its optimization. A game cannot be separated from the microtransactions that are tacked onto it. A game cannot be separated um, from uh, the decisions of, of the people who made that game. They're, they're all entangled. However, the actual experience of just playing the game, um, even with the performance issues, even with those, it's really great, okay? I'm having a really goddamn good time with the game. And I know I started this segment off with that, but I really am enjoying this game. The world is fantastical and beautiful and full of monsters. The gameplay, there's like, I don't even remember 10 different classes that you can play and all of them feel very distinct and unique and exciting. I've, I've been playing uh, mage and then sorcerer, and the, the pawn system is, is amazing. The game looks fantastic, even when, even when it has frame drops. The game visually is incredibly beautiful. The monster design is, is, is compelling. The world has, it, it is shockingly similar to Dragon's Dogma 1, but not in like a bad way. Uh, it really does carry forward the basic gameplay feel and the, the, the story feel of the world. It really did, it's amazing with so many years between the titles um, that, that that's, that, that it, it still carries so much of the spirit with it. That doesn't happen all that often. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of stuff to enjoy. Um, it is a game, Dragon's Dogma has an element of wackiness to everything in it. Um, the physics are wild, the monsters are huge and unpredictable. Uh, uh, you, things like, wild things happen, okay? The monsters can drag you all over the place, they can throw you. There's, you know, the, the wolves will bite you. If you, if a wolf knocks you over, a wolf can drag you. It can run, pulling you by the collar of your clothes while your teammates are sprinting after you to try to get you out of the wolf's clutches. Um, the other day, uh, just yesterday, uh, I was fighting a, an ogre, okay? Which, the ogres look more like trolls to me, okay? It's kind of troll-like. I always call them trolls, but they're ogres, okay? I'm fighting an ogre, and the ogre starts tipping over, okay? And my pawn goes, I'll take care of this monster for you, Arisen! Master, I'll save you! Jumps and does a jumping attack, grabs onto the monster's head, and tips it over, over the cliff and into the river, dying instantly and also killing the monster. And that is like, a th that sort of thing is the type of thing that will happen all the time in these games. The pawns are crazy bastards and they do insane things all the time. I have had pawns pick up and pitch explosive barrels into the middle of a giant bloodbath with like 15 different characters fighting. There are NPCs roaming all over the world. They can dynamically get in fights with monsters. Sometimes you'll be walking towards a city. A monster will attack the city. The villagers are getting crushed by the monster. The town guards are trying to fight the monster and your pawn will run in and do a suicide bombing with a, uh, a comically large explosive barrel like that one gif of Batman running with the comical bomb. Okay, it is amazing. There's a bunch of different pawn personalities and there's all these invisible systems in the game that add to the like wackiness factor. And I love it. I've been having a great time with that, that aspect of it. And it's really good in this game. Uh, there's a ton of variety um, in items. And of course, 
the fashion is incredible. As an example of this, I wanted to just show you, I just wanted to show you all my character. Now, some of you who were here earlier, you probably saw my character already, but the rest of you are going to be lucky enough to get to see my character now. And I want you to behold my amazing character, okay? Look at her. Oh my God, isn't she amazing? Look at her. Oh, she's, she's so cool. Look at how much swag she has. Look at this. And this is, this is like a low level outfit. I've barely explored the game. This is a whole cloak of raven's feathers. I've got like a, a monster scale tiara. I've got this admittedly simple wooden staff and it's just exuding style. And this is one of the outfits. I have like three other absolutely swag outfits that I haven't gone to take screenshots of because, um, because I've just started playing the game and I only took a certain number of screenshots uh, before I had to stream today. It's amazing. The fashion is out of control. Um, and I really like it. And uh, there's just, there's the world is huge. There's the, the quest design. I have run into a couple of quests that were a little bit weird, maybe even a little buggy, but also that's kind of par for the course for Dragon's Dogma. The first Dragon's Dogma, um, they don't give you a lot of quest information. And the reason for that is because you're supposed to talk to lots of NPCs and you are supposed to also have your pawns help you out. And that's doubly true in this game. Um, pawns, there's a whole system by which you can bring other people's pawns into your world. And those pawns will come with quest knowledge from quests that they've done with their, with the, with their owner, okay? And the same thing goes for your pawn. If, you, if somebody borrows your pawn to take to their world, their, your pawn will bring with it any knowledge of any quests that it's been on with you. Pawn knowledge is this entire whole system that's incredible. There's it, The pawns can learn strategies for beating monsters. They can learn the location of secret treasures. They can learn uh, advice for quests. They can learn, um, you know, different locations on the map. And they can be shared between players asynchronously through this whole system. And um, it's really amazing. It's so robust. There's so many details to the pawn system that I could keep going on for hours. I don't want to spoil everything, but I promise you, it's really deep. And it's incredibly fun. Um, and they've also made a bunch of changes to the structure of the pawn system so that you can, it incentivizes constantly trying new pawns and inviting other people's pawns in. Uh, you can set quests where you give a reward to your pawn. And if somebody else takes that pawn on the quest that you set for it, then they'll get that reward. Super cool. So basically, here's an example. I want my pawn to become an expert at killing ogres. In order to become an ogre killing expert, my pawn needs to kill 75 ogres. I can put a quest on my pawn that says, if you take my pawn to kill three ogres, then I'll give you 10,000 gold, which is a good amount of gold. Or I'll give you this really good healing item, or I'll give you a crafting item. And that pawn, people can grab that pawn from the pawn pool, pull it into their party, accomplish the quest, and get that item. And you can do that with other people's pawns. It means that there's this super asynchronous, cool multiplayer system that is just really amazing. It's so much fun. And I've been engaging with the pawn system endlessly. Plus, it means you get to meet all these different pawns, designs, and character personality mixtures, and classes, and all kinds of stuff. You just get to see so much of the variability the game has to offer. It's really great. Now, there are two strange things that I have to talk about, which this is mostly going to be directed towards Dragon's Dogma 1 players. If you were a a player of Dragon's Dogma 1, Dragon's Dogma 1, you will probably remember that throwable items were a, a major item type 
in Dragon's Dogma 1. You know, like a, a, a flask of oil that lets you splash oil on somebody. A cursed stone that you throw and it makes somebody silent so they can't spell, you know, cast spells. A piece of rotten meat that you can throw at somebody and they get poisoned. So stuff like that. And in Dragon's Dogma 1, the throwing system kind of massively sucked. In Dragon's Dogma 1, there was no item hotbar. So to throw an item, you'd have to press start to open the item menu, go to the item, press uh, hold, like to hold in your hand, and then your character would reach into their bag, take it out, and then you could throw it. Very clunky, very annoying. Now, in Dragon's Dogma 2, oh, and also, when you threw the item, you don't get to aim. You just kind of like, there is a static throw distance and you point your character in the direction, you press the throw button, and they throw it, and it does like a little arc. You can't control it, you can't aim at all. You can't aim up, aim down, none of that. You just have to kind of point your character and throw. Now in Dragon's Dogma 2, they have added a proper throwing system. So you can pick up a big rock, you can aim the big rock, and you get like a little aiming thing, and you can throw it. So you can hit birds out of the sky, or drop it, drop... One of my favorite things is dropping rocks down on the heads of enemies, which is really important because enemies are very difficult in this game. So you got to kind of think about your environment and you can do a lot of damage by throwing a rock off of the, uh, a high cliff and crushing a goblin skull. Cool throwing system, right? But there's no throwable items. Which is like, I was just like, wait, what? And I, 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 was, I was shocked that there was no throwables in Dragon's Dogma 2 despite the fact that there is now a throwing system. The only thing that you can throw in Dragon's Dogma 2 is rocks and other environmental objects. You can pick up a box or a, or a rock or a, uh, or a boulder or a, or a barrel of explosives or a poison barrel, but there are no equipable throwing items, which makes it even weirder that enemies in the game have equipable throwing items. There are guards and goblins that will pick, will throw oil flasks or fire bombs or poison things at you. And, and so I don't know why they did that. I'm really confused. Now, this won't make any difference if you, to you if you didn't play Dragon's Dogma 1. You won't be missing anything, uh, really, at all. But coming from having played Dragon's Dogma 1, I was shocked that they didn't put in all of the many throwing items that there were in Dragon's Dogma 1 that were kind of useless. They literally did an inversion. In Dragon's Dogma 1, there were hundreds or dozens, dozens or hundreds of different throwable items. Empty, empty flasks, glass, uh, ceramic jars. Uh, ceramic jars are one of the meme ones. You could literally throw pies in Dragon's Dogma 1 at people. Jester's pies. And there was, but, but throwing them was incredibly stupid pointless and all and meant that most of the time you're not going to use any of them and then in dragon's dogma 2 they build a throwing system and there's none of the items there it's yeah, i don't know you can still throw your pawns you can still throw monsters you can still throw pawns onto monsters and you still can throw monsters into other monsters which is good all those things still exist but there's no throwable items which is Celestial Heart says, don't worry, throwing items are going to come in the DLC. I, it's really funny that you should make that joke. My partner made that joke too. And unfortunately, I'm actually a little worried you might be right. You might be right. Unfortunately. We'll see though. We'll see. Yeah. Um... And uh, that brings me to the second thing that only Dragon's Dogma 1 players will care about, really. Which is that they changed, a, they made a really weird change to one specific aspect of the game. In Dragon's Dogma 1, you can go to an inn and all inns maintain a universal storage. So there's just like a, you have an item storage with infinite weight that you can throw items into and store at the inn. And any inn can access your item storage. It's a universal, it's like the storage box in a Dark Souls game. You can get it from anywhere, or from any inn. You can't get it while you're out on the field. You have to go to an inn to do it. But 
uh, in the first Dragon's Dogma, every inn also had an equipment menu where you could just click equipment and it would let you see all of the equipment that you have in a particular category in your inventory or in your storage so that you could quickly compare gear and swap gear. Super simple, straightforward, right? They got rid of that. That option only. That's the only option that doesn't exist. And it's not here in Dragon's Dogma 2, which is really strange. So you actually have, if you want to check your current equipment versus equipment in your, uh, uh, versus equipment that's in your storage, you have to withdraw it from your storage and then check it in the menu. <laughs> Very strange decision. I think they're going to probably patch that. I feel like that might have been unintentional. It's like a feature a, a feature that existed in the first game that for some reason doesn't exist in the second game. Very minor, but strange nonetheless. Other than that, there are more classes than the first game. The classes seem expanded pretty significantly. Um, the game looks amazing. There's a ton of monsters in the game from what I can tell. Obviously, I've only played, you know, however many hours, how many hours have I played since it launched? It says I've played 22 hours. I don't think I've actually, some of that was idling. So I've probably played somewhere around 16 hours total. Some of that was definitely idling. I know for sure because I I went and did things while the game was still running. Um, but, uh, but I've played somewhere in the ballpark of 16 hours or so in this game. So I have a lot of game left to go. Um, I know people who rushed this game and even rushing through the game it took them 40 hours. This game is massive, okay? So I don't know what to expect, and there might be things that I come... There's going to be some things that I discover once I complete the game um, that will probably change my mind or that, that I'll have more to say. So I'll probably do a full review once I beat the game in the future. But I wanted to take some time talking about my first impressions, the controversy, and whether or not I actually recommend playing Dragon's Dogma 2. And the simple answer is, I do. Uh, I think Dragon's Dogma 2 is a really fucking fun game. And I think that you will get your money's worth if you decide, excuse me, to buy and play it. I do think it's an incredibly fun game. I, I don't think that you should ignore the problems. And uh, if, if the existence of microtransactions alone bothers you, you can skip it. But... I do think the game is really good, and I've been having a great time with it so far. Um, of course, I'll have a final say at the end, but I've already gotten, you know, 16 to 20 hours of good play out of it. Uh, and the first eight or so of those hours were without me even knowing the microtransactions were in the game. They're not accessible from in the game. There's no, like, DLC or microtransaction menu. They're just in the Steam shop. Uh, or the Xbox store, depending on what platform you're playing on. Um, yeah. The reality is, here, yeah, is this the dog clip? Here, I'll play the dog clip so you can get an idea. Yeah, this is the dog clip. This is not my clip. This is from Dan's Gaming. So check this clip out, okay? This is an idea of what you can expect, the wackiness that you can expect playing Dragon's Dogma 2. Okay, here we go. Just enjoy Ow! It. Hey! Hey! That's a bad, bad dog. Bad dog. Bad dog. The bad dog. Get up. No, you gotta help me. So what's happening here is his pawn, which is a healer pawn, is casting the heal spell and not attacking. So he's pinned by three wolves currently and is being healed at approximately the same amount of health that he is taking in damage. Let's go! Get off of me! Get him off of me! You're not helping! I can't get off because they won't attack! Oh my god! And there we go, the, the wolf grabs him again. And he's being run and dragged. Another by the one wolf. took me. Ow. 
Yes, this type of nonsense is only a fraction of the type of nonsense that you'll get up to in these games. The enemies love to grapple you. Um, they will throw you. There is a enemy. There is an enemy type that will straight up football throw you, whoosh, as far away as it can. And in fact, there are monsters that have the possibility to take off the ground, flying monsters that will take off while you're on them. So you can be grappled onto a monster like a griffin or a drake. Usually it's griffins because those ones like to run. Um, and they can just take you to a completely other side of the continent while you're holding on to them. It's incredible. This game is ridiculous. And most games do not do that type of nonsense, okay? Most games do not have the commitment to do annoying things like that that are nonetheless extremely funny and memorable. Most games don't do it. But Dragon's Dogma 2 does. So, all in all, there are issues and the game deserves criticism. But I'm having a really good time with it so far. It is scratching an itch. Uh, for for fantasy intense combat with lots of planning and inventory management required. I didn't even touch on the inventory management. Inventory management is a huge part of these games. Um, and if you like that type of stuff, it's, it's fun. Um, it's carried forward the spirit of the first game in so many ways, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what the rest of the game has to bring. So if you're looking for a game and you don't mind dealing with a little bit of performance and optimization issues, you're not going to get consistent 60 FPS in this game. So if you're somebody who cannot play a game that's not getting 60 FPS, you should probably wait on Dragon's Dogma 2 until they do some patches. Um, in truth, there are points in the game when it might dip below 30, but for the most part, it's fairly easy to get consistent 30 FPS, but not 60, unfortunately. So... There's, there's, there's the informative uh, and the artistic analysis of Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, this was a much longer review than I intended it to be, but I hope you enjoyed my funny stories and all the nonsense that I had to talk about. Thanks for listening, and make sure you subscribe to Demon Mama down below.